Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. My name is Mike Brand. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs at Georgetown's Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Really appreciate you all coming out today. Um, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome up Ambassador Makarova to give some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome all to Ukraine House. Uh, my opening remarks are going to be very short because we are uh, here for a very important discussion and I myself look forward to this discussion so I will not take a lot of uh, time for my opening remarks. But I just want to say how grateful we are to uh, Alexandra Matvichuk, our um, amazing Ukrainian, uh, very distinguished, prominent human rights lawyer and activist, and also the chairwoman of 2022 Nobel Prize winner, a very important, again, Center for Civil Liberties, who you all in the audience know uh, very well. Uh, Alexander, for me, exemplifies everything we know about Ukrainians, how relentless we are in the fight for human rights and for dignity, and also how she personally shows uh, such a great courage and leadership by example. I'm also very happy that we're doing it together with you, Ambassador Vervir, who is a personal friend, a very distinguished uh, Ukrainian, American at the same time, a woman who has been a role model to so many American and Ukrainian women, showing that, uh, as Condoleezza Rice said, women should have the right not to be, not, not only should have the right to be leaders, but we should expect women to be leaders. And uh, Milan, thank you for inspiration to tell in so many of us that we can be whoever we want to be, but when we become leaders, it's our responsibility to lead. Uh, also great to see here uh, Christine Levas, the director of uh, the War Cat, as we joke sometimes, the coolest cats at the uh, DOJ. Uh, but uh, she, Christine, is the lead prosecutor for Ukraine Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section. And when the War Cat has been created, it was such a resounding message to everyone. Like it was when the special prosecutor on Nazi crimes had been appointed, that no matter how much time it will take, no matter how much effort it will take. Russian crimes will not go unpunished. And unfortunately, we know that there are so many of these Russian crimes. Today is already 845th day of the full-fledged phase of this war. And unfortunately, during these 845 days, we have seen tragedies and war crimes of unimaginable proportions. Uh, we have seen rapes and tortures. We have seen killings and kidnapping of children. We have seen these crimes everywhere in Ukraine where now Russia doubled down on their air raids, but also on the occupied territories. For us in Ukraine, it's nothing new. We have seen it for the past 10 years in Crimea, in Donetsk, in Luhansk, at Alexandra and her center. And so many human rights activists have worked tirelessly since 2014 to tell the world this truth to support people who were oppressed on these territories. And frankly, way too many human rights activists and, and lawyers and journalists have been also arrested illegally by Russians for just doing this work. So this must stop. We have to do everything possible to win in this war, but also to defend the dignity and restore the justice. And I just want to close, I mean, you, you all have seen very active two weeks in our bilateral agenda, but not only bilateral agenda, the G7 uh, summit where President Zelensky has been present with very important statement and decisions. Uh, Peace Formula Summit just recently where almost 100 countries came together and more than 80 signed the, um, uh, the, the communique telling that it's not okay in the 21st century to do this, but also saying that it's Ukraine who wants peace. It's Ukraine who pushes for peace, but not just for any peace, for just and lasting peace. And if you take a look at the bilateral agreement, the 17th bilateral agreement, which we signed on defense, on security uh, cooperation with the United States, uh, it has very important parts on defense, on, on uh, weapons, on everything else, but it has also a very important part on accountability. Because there is no peace without accountability. There is no peace without justice, regardless of how much time it will take. 
And for that, I'm very grateful, Sandra, to you, and Milan for your uh, tireless efforts, and Christine for you and your team doing it together with the Prosecutor General Kostin, who has this as the high priority. I mean, he has many uh, crimes, unfortunately, he has to take care, but this is the war crimes and the crimes against uh, uh, human dignity, human lives, uh, is, is, the, is the priority number one. So with that, again, thank you to Ukraine House for once again welcoming us here, uh, this home away from home with now beautiful um, abstract art from Ukrainian, but also uh, British uh, uh, arts, uh, arts men now in, in, in on display. It's great that we have this home away from home. I'm very proud that we do have it, and let's thank you for all uh, to come into this very important e event, Ambassador. Uh, very happy to see you, and again, just want to openly say how grateful we are for your tireless efforts uh, uh, leading in the crime in the crime of aggression effort and tribunal. Uh, and uh, you and your country have been irreplaceable in this effort. So, thank you very much. Welcome, and I look forward to a wonderful discussion. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Ambassador Makarova. Uh, as we all know, we're so proud of the work that she has done representing Ukraine here in the United States. She's been absolutely indefatigable, truly tireless, uh, always articulate, always reminding us what's at stake, uh, not just for Ukraine, but for democracy uh, and for the international world order that we all care so deeply about. So thank you for all that you're doing, for bringing us together this morning, because uh, we're, we're very proud indeed to be co-sponsoring um, this event uh, at the, with, the, with the Ukrainian Embassy. Um, I also want to thank Ambassador Sparberg, who's here from Liechtenstein, because as Ambassador Makarova has said, he too has been extraordinarily are, are outspoken about how critical, and his country, about how critical the issues are that we're discussing today, um, war crimes, accountability, what really has to go into defending uh, the rights of every human being. So thank you for your work as well. And now it gives me great personal pleasure to uh, introduce Alexandra Matvichuk. I just saw her in Berlin literally three days ago uh, where she was speaking at the opening of the Ukraine Recovery Conference. Uh, which was a really important gathering uh, from nations around the world to contribute uh, to short and long-term recovery of Ukraine uh, that's going on while electrical grids have to be repaired, while infrastructure has to be repaired, and, and certainly the long-term kind of recovery and reconstruction that has to happen. There was a special session in Berlin uh, focused on the gender response to reconstruction and recovery, that women have to be truly involved, uh, their perspectives and experience and talents brought to this. Uh, as we all know, they've been critical responders, as Alexandra has been throughout the war, both as diplomatic advocates, some 60,000 in the security sector now, doing all kinds of uh, incredible heavy lifting um, during these difficult times. So, uh, Alexander from Berlin, now to Washington. First to Liechtenstein. <laughs> oh, Liechtenstein, okay. So she never stops either. Uh, and this afternoon she's gonna be at the White House uh, for an event on conflict-related uh, sexual violence. And Ambassador Rapp, it's good to see you Great as well, uh, who has uh, run the critical office in the um, State Department on these issues in the, previously when we worked together. Uh, but he, too, has never stopped on these issues. Um, so anyway, Alexandra has gone to all of these places. She will be at the White House this afternoon with a very focus on conflict-related sexual violence. But we're glad she's with us here this morning. Um, she, as you heard uh, from, uh, from Ambassador Malkadova, uh, has been um, assiduously working on these issues, bringing them to world attention. She's a human rights lawyer. She's the recipient of the 2022 
Nobel Peace Prize for her work with the NGO, the Center for Civil Liberties, tireless advocate for human rights, for democracy, for solidarity in Ukraine. Uh, and she, along with others, has been documenting these war crimes, including um, the war crime of um, sexual violence and conflict, all part of Russia's assault um, on Ukraine. So, Alexandra, please, everybody's here to hear you, uh, and I know you will call us to action as well. I'm very grateful to organizers of this event for this unique opportunity to address to the distinguished audience. I'm a human rights lawyer, and I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity for many years. But now I and other Ukrainian human rights lawyers found ourselves in a situation when the law doesn't work. Because Russian troops are deliberately shelling residential buildings, schools, churches, museums, and hospitals. They are attacking evacuation corridors. They are torturing people in infiltration camps. They are forcibly taking Ukrainian children to Russia. They ban Ukrainian language and culture. They are abducting, robbing, raping, and killing civilians in the occupied territories. And the entire UN system of peace and security can't stop this. We united efforts with dozens of organizations from different regions. We built a national network of local documentators and covered the whole country, including the occupied territories. And working together, only for these two years of large-scale war, we jointly documented more than 72,000 episodes of war crimes. And to be clear, we are documenting something much more than just violations of Geneva and Hague Conventions. We are documenting human pain. I would like to illustrate it with one story from the 72,000 episodes. This is a story of 14-year-old 40, uh, girl, Sophia. She, her mother, and her younger uh, sister and brother was in Mariupol when Russian troops tried to seize the city. Uh, Russians didn't allow the International Committee of Red Cross to open green corridors and to evacuate civilians. So, Sophia and her family, like thousands of other people in Mariupol have to hide in the basement of their residential building from the Russian shelling. One day, the family was bombed by Russian aircraft. Her brother died immediately. Her mother died a few hours after she was taken after the rubble of residential buildings, and she was buried in the yard of their house. I want to quote this girl. I went to dig out my mother. I tried to do it with my hands because there were no shovels nearby. Some aircraft were flying around me. I was so scared that moment, but I just wanted to help my mom. I dug her up so she could rest. And then I went to ask for help. We have 72,000 such stories in our database, and I, as a human rights lawyer, have one question. How we people who live in the 21st century will defend a human beings, their lives, their freedom, and their human dignity? Can we rely on the law, or does just brutal force matter? The answer to this question is important not just for people in Ukraine, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, Sudan, or Nicaragua. The answer to this question will define our common future. Unpunished evil crimes. Russian troops committed horrible crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, 
in Libya, in Syria, in other countries of the world. They have never been punished. They believe they can do whatever they want. I personally interviewed hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity and they told me horrible stories, how they were beaten, raped, smashed into wooden boxes, electrical shocks with their genitalia, their fingers were cut, their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled. One woman told me how her eye was the couch with a spoon. It was no legitimate reason in doing such things. There is also no military necessity in it. Russians did these horrible things only because they could. It's um, brightly illustrated by sexual violence during this Russian war against Ukraine, which we recorded. Sexual violence during the war is a method of warfare because through the concrete individuals, Russians try to destroy the whole communities which help to save the control over these territories. How it works? The survivors of sexual violence feel shame. Their neighbors, their families, their relatives feel guilt because they couldn't stop it. And other members of community feel fear because they can be subjected to the same treatment. And all this complex mixture of uh, shame, guilt, and fear decrease the level of connections between members in the local communities and help Russia to save the control. But I don't want to leave expression that women in Ukraine and like general people in Ukraine are just victims of Russian aggression. We are fighters. We are fighters for freedom and for democracy in all different places. Like these women who survived from sexual violence, they created Sama network and they started to fight for justice for them and for other people who were subjected to such horrible crimes. And this is extremely courageous because I always told to myself, if these women who survived the hell now finding a strength to restore not just their broken life, broken families, broken vision of the future, but their broken belief that justice is possible, even though they lie in time, if these women continue their fight for justice, we have no luxury to stop. We have to do even more. At the end of my introductory remark, I want to remind why justice is so important. <clears throat> I know from my own experience that this war turned people into the numbers because the scale of our crimes grows so large that it becomes impossible to recognize all the stories. And that's why in all of my speeches I try to tell the stories. Because what we are doing, naturally, we are returning people their names. Because people are not numbers. We must ensure justice for all victims of this war, regardless who they are, their social position, the types of crime they endured, and whether or not media or international organizations are interested in their case. And only justice can do it. Justice can prove that life of each person matters. And justice is precondition to sustainable peace in our part of the world where Russia for decades used the war as a tool how to achieve their geopolitical interests and for decades uses war crimes as a message how to win this war. Sometimes people speaking about justice think that justice is only about the past and about the future about the past because people are persecuted for something which they have already done. For the future because it's a strong signal if you will do something the same, you will be also persecuted. But justice have a huge impact to present. Let me demonstrate it. Perpetrators of uh, 
torture which we documented during this war are confident that they will avoid responsibility like they did in Chechnya, in Syria, in Georgia, in other countries of the world. If we will start a decisive legal actions, for example, to create a special tribunal on aggression as international court to recover unity, which Putin has accorded in international law, and all other steps in this comprehensive justice strategy, it will have a result. Because even if a part of Russians start to be doubt that probably this time they will not avoid responsibility for something which they committed, it will be a cooling effect for brutality of human rights violations. This doubt will result it and convert it in this cooling effect. And because we're speaking about time of large-scale war, it means that we will save thousands, 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 and thousands of lives. Thank you. Alexandra, those were powerful words, justice, human dignity, resilience, your call to action for why we should all be part of the struggle. Uh, so thank you for reminding us. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about some of these issues in, in a little bit more detail, and then we're going to hear from uh, our representative from the Department of Justice. Uh, I had mentioned in... Um, introducing you that we were together not that many days ago uh, in Berlin at the Ukraine Recovery Conference, which was a, an extraordinary gathering of some 3,000 people who were committed uh, to helping Ukraine go through the transition. Uh, and you were eloquent, as always, uh, in the session about gender responsive re recovery and reconstruction. Tell us a little bit about why it's important uh, to engage women's leadership. We see it exemplified by you uh, in every way. And why conflict-related sexual violence needs to be part of what happens currently in terms of accountability, but certainly uh, when this war ends. I always explain the difference um, between Russia and Ukraine uh, using the gender perspective. Because I know a nervous amount of fantastic women in Ukraine in different fields of society. Women are fighting in Ukraine armed forces. Women coordinate civil initiatives. Women make important political decisions. Women document war crimes. Women are in the far front of this battle for freedom and for democracy because bravery has no gender. And this is a bright illustration that this is not just a war between two states, Russia and Ukraine, but this is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. Because in democratic countries, a woman can perform any role she wants. But in Russia and all other autocracies, a woman can perform only a sign role for her and family and society. And um, this is a basis for the authoritarian regime because established relationship between people and society always reflect the society idea of what political power can be. And that is why in Norway, men and women have equal rights. In Afghanistan, women are prohibited to study in universities. And in Russia, domestic violence was decriminalized because it's always just a projection of what government itself does to its own people. So, in this war with Russia, Ukrainian women are fighting for our daughters. I always say this, because we want our daughters will have, a, will have never face a need to prove someone that they are also human beings. And that is why, because women play so crucial a role in this battle for freedom and democracy, it's so important for international partners, international donors to 
secure the role of women in all stages of recovery. And this is, was uh, something which I'm talking uh, during the Ukrainian Recovery Conference in Berlin, which means that women have to be involved in decision making and implementation of recovery in all stages, from the planning to civil control. And second, your, the second part of the question was about sexual violence uh, during the war, and it's a very sensitive question because, uh, like in any conflict, it's a crime of shame, and everything which we document just the tip of iceberg. I remember from myself how I interviewed one people, and these people told me because men and women was held in one cell together without any facilities. Um, that one per, uh, people from the cell uh, was regularly raped. And um, based on these testimonies, uh, later I, sp I spoke with these concrete people. And these people told about horrible details of torture, but didn't mention about sexual violence. Because it's a, it's a crime of shame, and uh, our first uh, uh, priority as a human rights defender is to provide assistance for the survivors of sexual violence, psychological, medical, and all others. And then it's totally their right to start or to refuse to start uh, criminal proceedings. But it's also true that when we will create more uh, human-centric justice ecosystems, the percentage will be more and more higher of people who are willing to say about well, their perpetrators and willing to fight for justice. And that's why um, we are on our way in September 2022, the Special Department in Office of General Prosecutor was uh, opened, a department uh, related to sexual violence, and uh, uh, with the uh, support of international organizations, a lot of trainings were conducted for lawyers, for prosecutors, for judges. Uh, so there are positive steps, but we will have to do more. Um, and uh, probably I will stop here. So you, you've spoken a lot about uh, accountability um, and the fact that a price has to be paid for these horrible atrocities. Are there sufficient international mechanisms? Do you have the tools uh, to deal with the war crimes, with the genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, and also the sexual violence that's happening in this war? Um, is, what is missing? or? Is it sufficient and we just need to power on? Probably I will mention three things. First, there are four types of international crimes. War crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and crime of aggression, and Russia committed all these types of crimes. And there is no international court which can prosecute Russia for the crime of aggression. Unfortunately, even international criminal court has no such jurisdiction in situation of Russian war against Ukraine. And that is why Ukrainian civil society and Ukrainian state officials are promoting the idea of creation a special tribunal on aggression. And what is important, we want to create such tribunal in the form of international court to be able to overcome immunity, which Putin has according to international law. And I know that there is, there is a very hard discussion among these 44 countries, which is in this core group, um, to, on, uh, to work on this issue. But frankly speaking, as a human rights lawyer, I have no argument how to explain people in Ukraine people in the United States, people in Liechtenstein, people in other countries that we have invested enormous efforts, times and resources to create a special tribunal to prosecute people responsible for the crime of oppression. And this tribunal have no power to prosecute the most responsible one. 
Second thing, um, when we speak about sexual uh, violence during the war, um, probably I will mention the gap in our Ukrainian legislation because unfortunately Ukrainian criminal courts are not in line with international humanitarian and international criminal law. For example, we have no responsibility for the crime of aggression while this illegal practice of detention, torture, sexual violence was made several times in different reports of the uh, UN International Commission on Inquiry or um, like uh, OIC Moscow mechanisms report like crimes against humanity and we have no tool how to qualify it and prosecute it properly. So this is something which has to be solved and I hope that Ukrainian parliamentarians uh, will will uh, do something in this regard in the nearest future. And third problem, it's a problem with international law. Because as a lawyer, I know that in order to prove the genocide, um, it's, um, it's very difficult because it's a crime of crime. You have to reach a very high standard of proving, and it's okay, it's normal. But the problem is that existing UN Convention on Genocide uh, didn't include this uh, very important concept, which was in previous uh, idea of, of crime of genocide uh, elaborated by Rafael Lemkin because um, there is no necessity to be a lawyer to understand a very simple thing. If you want to destroy partially or completely some national group, so you have this genocidal intent, there is no need for you to kill all representatives of this national group. You can forcibly change their identity. And the entire national group will disappear. It's common logic. And uh, this is something which I feel there is uh, like a gap in international law, this understanding of this cultural aspect of genocide. But law, it's not conservative, it's dynamic material. So I hope that in future it will be changed, not just for Ukrainians, but to stop such thing in horrible uh, atrocities in other parts of the globe because regardless where the uh, crimes, uh, international crimes are committed, it's provided a threat to the whole humankind. Thank you for that very complete explanation on some of these tough issues. Um, give us a sense of what it's like on the ground. There are so many Ukrainians like yourself working day and night doing varied um, uh, jobs that uh, many of them have emanated from this war and need to be dealt with. But on, on the um, sexual violence issue, the documentation, you, you mentioned the shame that comes with it, the difficulty and really, if you've been violated, to say that that's the case because it's stigmatized in many ways. Talk a little bit about what it's like to collect the evidence to, to work with the survivors to provide for them what they need, given what they've been through. Uh, because it's easier to talk about the issues without really understanding what goes into it. It's difficult. Because um, first and foremost, we are human beings. And um, I have been documenting on crime since 2014. And even me, with my knowledge, with my um, field experience, with um, like everything which I have, uh, I, I, I wasn't prepared for such level of atrocities. Um, I still can't to, to build this distance. Sometimes um, I have a feeling that this pain, which we're documenting, it's burning you out, like it's some physical pain, some physical material. But then I told to myself, okay, probably it's, it's normal, because if you start uh, um, to lose this ability of empathy, it means that you ruin yourself like personality. So we all pay in our price, that's why I told that it's difficult, because um, even to be present, um, no 
not to experience, but even to be present with uh, war crimes, uh, through inter interviewing uh, victims or victims uh, or witness. Um, it's uh, difficult, and that's why during these 10 years, a lot of people from Human Rights Society was burned out and gone. Especially taking into account that first years of the war, we focused on legal play, uh, practice of detentions, torture and sexual violence and killing civilians, and we sent numerous reports to UN, to Council of Europe, to OECE, to European Union. We tried to use all human rights mandate, which we know, but nothing was changed. And um, you can find yourself in a situation when you ask, what are you doing? For, for what? what? What is the sense of your work? Because while you're interviewing the next survivors of sexual violence, you know, even before large scale war started, that the same war is going on in 143 legal places of detention which we identified before large scale war. And it's much, much more. But uh, what keeps all of us going is a uh, belief that all our efforts have sense. That Yes, the law doesn't work, but it's temporary. It's not the first time in the history of humankind when the law doesn't work, but we previously managed to restore international order and to deliver justice. And I think that all generations have their own historical um, um, responsibilities. Our historical responsibilities is to make justice independent of when and how the war will end. Because if we want to prevent wars in the future, we have to punish the states and their perpetrators, their leaders, I mean, who start such wars in present. But in the whole history of humankind, we have only one such precedent, it was Nuremberg trial. All other tribunals which you probably heard, like Rwanda, Yugoslavia, tribunals or special court of Sierra Leone, I will simplify it a little bit, but it's where courts where people were persecuted because they kill each other not according to the rules of the war. We have to prohibit war as a such on an illegal um, living. And that's why there is no necessity for us to wait when and how the war will end. We have to send a signal that regardless do you win this war, do you lose this war? If you start aggressive war, international community will punish you. And this is only the recept, how we can have a sustainable peace in, in, in our world. You know, and it, it, it reminds me just how tough this is. I was in, um, in Bosnia two weeks ago, and that war took place more than 25 years ago. Most of the women who were violated, and it's in the thousands, have never had any sense of accountability or justice. And one woman came up to me and she said, I can't live with myself because of what happened to me. But my perpetrator was the policeman on the corner today, and he is highly respected. And the sense of not being able to have justice in what happened. Uh, what you're trying to do, what you have to do on an even larger scale is truly difficult. Uh, and I think we have to all understand how hard it is and what we need to do. So let me ask you, um, you've got Ukrainians here, you have Ukrainian Americans, you have lots of Americans who care deeply about the struggle that is taking place today. What should we be doing? What would you what would you call us to do more? How can we support you in efforts of other Ukrainians like you, who are in the trenches, so to speak, doing that very difficult work that you described? As a human rights lawyer, I'm documenting war crimes so that sooner or later all Russians who committed these crimes by their own hands as well as Putin and top political leadership and high military command will be brought to justice. But it needs time. And we have no time. 
because time for us converted in humorous deaths in battlefield, in humorous deaths in deep fear, in humorous deaths in occupied territories. So as a human, I would urge you not just to support our fight for justice, but help Ukraine to win. Because this is the only way for current moment how we can prevent a new crimes to emerge. Six months of delay of military support from the United States to Ukraine resulted in a situation that uh, not just um, active um, actions in Donbas were conducted, but also Russia started to do it in a Kharkiv region near the border with Russia and start to prepare something uh, in Suma region near another border with Russia. And um, probably you heard in the news that Russians occupied new settlements, villages, and cities near the border in Kharkiv region. What does it mean from the human rights perspective? It means that we started to receive hundreds and hundreds of requests of help. Because a lot of people fled before Russians arrived, a lot but not all. And now they, are, they found ourselves, uh, themselves under Russian occupation. And Russian occupation means torture, rape, inferred disappearances, denial of your identity, forcible adoption of your own children, filtration camps, and mass graves. And these people reached us and ask us for help, and we can do nothing. We can do nothing. We can't stop Russian tanks with waving Geneva and her conventions. So we need time to be, to be able to do it as lawyers. And that's why probably my request will be, sounds a little bit weird, <laughs> but I will honestly tell that we need weapons. We need weapons to be able to defend our country, our people, and our human dignity. We need resources, like 300 billion of frozen Russian assets in G7 countries plus Belgium. And for lawyers, it's not a problem to find a legal way how to confiscate these efforts in accordance with rule of law. The problem not in law, the problem is in political will. And there are a lot of other things which has to be done to help Ukraine win, and people in the United States uh, can have a huge impact on these steps because you can urge your state officials to do more. We are very grateful for the United States, for other countries who are with us in this dramatic time of our history. We will never forget it. You helped us to survive. But while this genocidal war is still going on, we all need to do more. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you. And now to bring our program to a close, we're gonna to turn to an international human rights attorney uh, Christian Levesque, 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 Levesque. Um, she was appointed by the Attorney General of the United States of the War Crimes Accountability Team at the Department of Justice. She is the lead prosecutor for Ukraine human rights um, in special prosecution section at DOJ. So thank you for coming and giving us the perspective of what's happening at the Department of Justice on these issues. to be here with all of you who are so intensely committed to ending sexual violence in conflict and delivering justice for Ukraine and its people. As we are just a few days away from marking the 2024 International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence and Conflict, we have another opportunity to reinvigorate and strengthen our commitment and also to contemplate what still needs to be done. As President Biden, Attorney General Garland, and other U.S. leaders have expressed, 
the United States remains committed to doing all it can to end these human rights abuses. We do not accept conflict-related sexual violence as an inevitable cost of armed conflict. Governments, international organizations, civil society, and individual citizens must stand together and not only condemn sexual violence without equivocation and without exception, but to also consider those concrete steps, as Alexandra has been talking about, that should be taken to end these heinous abuses. To that end, we should recognize that Ukraine itself has developed and established new and pioneering methods and institutional mechanisms to address sexual crimes within its borders and criminal justice system. And they're doing this while they're still actively defending their country and the principles of democracy that everyone in this room holds dear. For example, and again, as Alexandra mentioned, the Prosecutor General's office has established a specialized conflict-related sexual violence unit. That unit marshals the relevant expertise and offers survivors a wider choice of professionals to work with, both men and women. And work is being done to extend this to investigators and prosecutors at the regional and local level. Their efforts are also ongoing to adapt procedures to ensure compliance with international standards and best practices. And the PGO continues to develop strategies on sexual violence to develop survivor sensitive proceedings. And of course, we applaud these efforts. In January this year, Ukraine's PGO officially opened the Victim and Witness Coordination Center to further its efforts towards justice and accountability for Russian aggression against Ukraine. And emphasizing the needs of victims during that official opening, the words of Prosecutor General Kostin should be restated. Each of the over 120,000 documented war crimes in Ukraine is not just a number, he said. And of course, we know that number has grown. Behind them are human lives and suffering, and our main duty, collectively, <clears throat> is to do everything possible to support those affected by war crimes in their pursuit of truth and justice. Now, his call to justice was not directed only at Ukraine. Other countries, international organizations, and civil society all have to do their part. And in this spirit, shortly after the full-scale invasion began in November 2022, President Biden signed a presidential memorandum directing the U.S. government to strengthen its exercise of financial, diplomatic, and legal tools against those committing sexual violence in conflict. That direction led to the first ever imposition of sanctions aimed at individuals responsible for or complicit in or who have directly or indirectly engaged in serious human rights abuse. And that includes sexual violence such as rape, sexual slavery, forced pregnancy, forced sterilization, and other forms of sexual harm that occur during armed conflict. The first sanctions issued of this kind were not focused specifically on the conflict in Ukraine, but have importantly paved the way for additional sanctions in the future, including those that arise from Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In further demonstration of the commitment to support survivors of conflict-related sexual violence and all forms of gender-based violence, the U.S. also committed additional financial resources to support the U.N and civil society in their efforts to promote justice and accountability through consistent and effective prosecution, and to foster greater governmental engagement to provide sustainable survivor-centered responses and enhance prevention efforts to address the root causes of the violence. Examples such as these, including both the efforts of Ukraine to establish a prosecutorial unit dedicated to sexual violence and the United States' presidential memorandum and subsequent sanctions initiatives and other related efforts are notable because they do more than just raise awareness of the problem, which is, of course, also important, but is now widely documented and understood to be persistent and ongoing. Rather, national authorities, international organizations, and civil society are again taking active steps to address this pernicious problem and ramp up accountability measures. The Department of Justice signaled its commitment to accountability for atrocities committed in Russia's aggression against Ukraine when our Attorney General announced the creation of the Justice Department's first ever War Crimes Accountability Team, WarCat, as the Ambassador mentioned. That was in June of 2022. 
And although this team is not specifically dedicated solely to, to sexual violence crimes, it was established to address atrocity crimes more generally occurring in Ukraine. And that, of course, includes sexual violence when it falls within our jurisdiction and the circumstances fit within our war crime statute. Having already indicted four Russia-affiliated military personnel for torturing a U.S. national in occupied Ukraine, we look forward to continuing our efforts in support of possible future indictments under the appropriate circumstances. And as we have acknowledged many times before, that historic indictment was made possible by the substantial assistance provided by the Ukrainian Prosecutor General's Office. These efforts for accountability also extend to assistance to Ukraine's Prosecutor General Office and are shared by our other key partners in the U.S. government, including the Department of State and the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group, and that's really just mentioning only a few. In closing, sexual violence in conflict is a violation of our shared sense of humanity. And when we speak about victims, we must acknowledge that no one is spared. The sexual violence occurring is brutal, and the victims include girls and boys, women and men, from early ages to the elderly, civilians and POWs in detention, again, many of whom are men, and those of diverse sexual orientation. When sexual violence and conflict occurs, we must hold perpetrators accountable, and as a lawyer, that's my professional focus, but we must also ensure that survivors have access to services and support, and that we're addressing other ways to increase deterrence for such crimes. We cannot singularly link deterrence to legal accountability mechanisms and processes. We have to leverage other policy, education, and diplomatic efforts as well to address the problem of conflict-related sexual violence. The United States remains committed to working with all of you to support accountability and the path to justice for Ukraine. <clears throat> the needs of those most affected by Russia's aggression against Ukraine should be prioritized. We must continue to support prosecutions, but we must also pursue holistic and comprehensive justice for those who have suffered from sexual violence so that they can heal, they can rebuild, and they can fight to secure democracy in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, and for telling us uh, what is happening uh, at DOJ on these issues. It's all hands on deck. Um, coordination is all important, and doing everything we can, obviously, um, is the overriding uh, call to action here. Um, we're going to bring this to a close. I want to thank Ambassador Makarova always for her extraordinary leadership, which we all greatly admire. Alexandra, may you continue to be able to do all that you're doing. Uh, thank you for being with us, and to you too, Christian. Thank you all for coming. There is an amazing array of Ukrainian delicacies from the restaurant Ruta in the adjoining rooms. Uh, please stay, uh, have some of the, of the uh, wonderful spread that's there, but most importantly, think about this discussion as you talk to each other, as you think about what you can do going forward from here, uh, because there's an awful lot to do in this difficult time. Uh, but together we can do far more than if we just act independently or don't do anything. So thank you all, and ever onward, there's much to do. Bye-bye.